I chose quite an exciting title for my talk today, Science Fiction in Healthcare, because I want to prove to you a few things, especially the fact that now we have to get ready for science fiction in healthcare. We have to be able to deal with the privacy issues of digital health technologies and get ready for whatever is coming next. And that's a huge challenge. And I think we should look at science fiction books and movies for inspiration to get ideas about how to think about the next day or so. And that, that's happening to me every day. I think my wife thinks I have a disease, an addiction to science fiction. But the reason why is that's where my inspiration comes from. That some books and movies make us ask very exciting questions, such as, is privacy dead? Or uh, what if an algorithm can be more humanistic than the best physician in the world? Or what if our final destination for humanity is not on planet Earth, but we have to become a multi-planetary species? It's all possible. But the reason why science fiction is so helpful is that it makes us think about the what-if question, and it makes us emotionally prepare for what's coming next. So I hope you don't mind if I play a little game with you right now, just in a minute or two. Um, you've been here for a few hours in this amazing conference, so you cannot know about the big thing that just happened outside the hotel. But when you go out, you will see. Uh, this is, I guess, the biggest milestone in the history of you know, us. So you will see them. They came. It finally happened. The first alien civilization just arrived to Earth a few minutes ago. If you go out, you will see that they have amazing spaceships and they have deadly weaponry and shiny armors and they brought beasts with them we've never seen before. They speak a very strange language. Um, I think you would agree that we would feel like this is the most important thing that has ever happened to us. And the next moment, we will be terrified to death about what might happen next. I also guarantee you that that's the same Montezuma felt when Cortez arrived with his fleet hundreds of years ago. They felt that these ships, they, these are some things they have never seen before. Those people just brought beasts with them, dogs and diseases. They have deadly weaponry and shiny armors, and they speak an unspoken language. I think they thought those people had to be gods, and also they were terrified to death about what might happen next. Well, that's how science fiction helps. Behind the intention of Cortes to go to South America was El Dorado, the story about the Golden Kingdom with the Golden King. So there's always an intention behind pushing the boundaries of us, science, further and further away. The issue is, these days, science fiction is becoming real. When I got an encyclopedia from my mother at the age of six and I decided to become a doctor, so I thought in 12 years I would go to medical school and in that year, being influenced by some of the best science fiction movies ever, I felt that in medical school, in 12 years from now, I would study anatomy through holographic images and amazing advanced technologies. It didn't help. I had to study anatomy from the smallest books in the world. And it's so hard because you have to learn about three-dimensional multi-layer structures on two-dimensional text. But last year, I got a chance to, chair, to choose and, and, and try out a new device, a head-mounted display, which I had to put on, click on a button, and I saw apps around me. There was no controller or mouse, so I had to click with my fingers. I, cho I chose an anatomy application, and in a second, this holographic image appeared in front of me. It had a beating heart, and I could dissect that human being without any limitation, the muscles, the bones, just with a click with my two fingers. So I, I felt like that six years old kid again, and there I met science fiction. I really hope for you that at least once in your lives you meet science fiction. You will feel the technological sublime that the reason why science fiction is so fantastic is that it gives us hope that one day everything can get better. And now things are changing very fast. Science fiction is sneaking its way into our lives. I mean, if I have an accident and I want to get a prosthetic arm, now these arms can do more freedom of movement than your great biological arms. Even the sense of touch is being put into those prosthetics. You have to know that the, the computing power your smartwatch has is nothing. It's much more compared to what the Apollo spaceship had that brought people to the moon. And we use it for counting the number of steps we take every day. We have to know that the best algorithms playing games like Go and chess could learn what they know in hours, not hundreds of years of experience, and now they are far better than the human players. 
we have to know that our kids will play in augmented reality. So while I play Lego with my daughter, she might be playing Minecraft through an AR device, so we might not even be in the same reality at the same time. And we have a chance to go to Mars and become multiplanetary species. That's pretty exciting. So that's how science fiction is finding its way into our lives. And far the best and far the most important industry and space for this is healthcare. What digital health technologies do is that they make you the point of care. Healthcare without an address. You are the point of care. Wherever you are, you get diagnostics, you get treatments on the go, because you are the one that matter. At least, that's the promise of digital health technologies. And it's real now. I'm standing right now before you, in front of you, saying that I am the patient from the future. For more than a decade now, I've been testing digital health technologies, from algorithms to genomic testing services, to show people what happens in real life when you start using advanced technologies and you start losing some of your privacy. In the last couple of years, I've learned how to track sleep, so I know how to get the most out of my sleep quality every night, even with a crying kid at home or a travel schedule. I never have jet lag, and I know exactly when to wake up, because a gadget tells me to. I give it 20 minutes before going to bed, and in the morning it finds the best spot when I'm in light sleep. And you know what it feels like to wake up in deep sleep when you hate the word and need cups of coffee. If waking up in light sleep is just being energized, and there might be two minutes between the two, but you can tell because you're asleep. A gadget can, and it changed my life. I learned how to motivate myself for exercising 30 minutes on average every day. Uh, and while running is the simplest and cheapest form of exercise, I think it's against human nature and I hate running. But by using sensors to motivate myself, it happens. So by using digital health sensors, I managed to find a way to motivate myself. I learned how to reuse stress, um, and it could help with those technologies, medical professionals, how to get burnt out, uh, not so much like they do these days. I learned how to meditate properly and then stop using the device because that's not how you reach mindfulness in the future, but that's how you learn how to meditate properly. I've had seven or six genetic tests. I had my whole genome sequence um, obtained and quantified and analyzed for me, so I know exactly what kind of medical conditions I have a risk for, what medications I, have, I will have a side effect for, and what I can expect from my future. I learned that I have a great risk for deep vein thrombosis, or uh, um, uh, I know that if I have to take a cholesterol-lowering medication, then my chance for a, quite a serious side effect is 95%. It's really good to know that. So I learned clinically useful and some useless things about my life, but I brought my whole genome sequencing data, my DNA data, to my GP, my third primary care physician. The first two were not so astonished by that, but now I have a partner in my physician who I can work with, so we have a real empowered partnership, not a hierarchy like in the old days. I even had my microbiome sequenced, the bacteria living in your digestive system, those three, four kilograms of bacteria that impact how you sleep, your mental health states, even, even your diet and your weight. I know who I'm living with because a company in California just sequenced the DNA of those bacteria, and now I even have that information. And I bring this package to my medical professionals. I expect them to act as partners because I, I know I can bring value to the table and I know that without their guidance, I'm lost in this jungle of health and digital information. So that's what we see. We see a cultural transformation that we call digital health that's changing the hierarchy of the doctor-patient relationship into an equal level partnership and that uses technologies that make patients the point of care. That's how anyone now can become the patient from the future. And I know that in my case, my privacy has been leaking for years. I know that even if I clicked on a service that I don't want to share my data with third parties, I'm sure they did, and they will keep on doing that. I know that when I measure my heart rate or blood pressure on the long term, those apps are not so secure. But I am the one having the freedom of choice. I know that I am the one making the decision how much of my privacy I'm willing to give up in exchange for a longer and healthier life, at least the chance for that. And I think that's what matters in this era of really advanced digital technologies, that on this scale, on one side, we have our health. I want to live a long and healthy life. I, 
I literally see myself boarding a spaceship to Mars at the age of 100 on my legs or with an exoskeleton, I'm fine with both. But I see myself at the age of 100 and I want all of you to live at least to 100 and that's what we have to shoot for now, knowing how medicine, healthcare, pharma and science have been developing. But that's one side. The other one is my security, is that my genome sequence is in the cloud, my heart rate, my blood pressure logs, everything is in the cloud and I'm pretty sure those are not safe. So the patient of the future must be, must be walking on very thin ice unless they get proper help, not from the medical professionals, that's not their job, but from policymakers worldwide. So what we do at the Medical Futurist Institute is that we look at models of how countries, governments look at this, how they try to solve this privacy issue of the, the digital health era. And we found four major, of course, generalized examples of models of how to deal with this. Well, all of these are based on the freedom of choice. The first example is China, where patients don't have much of a freedom of choice. They do, they do get access to advanced technologies, even artificial intelligence-based algorithms, but it's not really their choice. They use facial recognition systems, they, they build a social security score system based on those, and then you have to contribute to that. You are being part of it, you are becoming a part of it because you are pushed to. So you get access to technologies, but that's not really your kind of choice. That's the first model. The second is when you still don't have much of a choice, but the two things you have to look at is whether I'm willing to give up some of my privacy because I have to use advanced technologies, or I don't get access to care at all. That's the model we found in Rwanda, in Central Africa, where they had a genocide 20 years ago and they had to build everything from the ground up. They didn't have the financials to create healthcare systems like we have in many countries, so they had to take a leap into digital health technologies. In Rwanda, medical drones from a US company deliver medications and even packages to accidents. I mean, imagine a country where it's happening right now every single day. In Rwanda, more than 60% of the population have access to telemedicine. So even though they, they have doctor shortages and they know they can't send doctors to every rural part of Rwanda, those people have access to telemedicine, maybe even faster than you have in your, in your countries. Um, they use electronic medical records with supported by artificial intelligence-based algorithms. Really advanced systems because they had to take a leap into digital health. But still, patients don't have much of a freedom of choice. The third example or model is what we see when patients have a lot of freedom of choice and they want to bring it to the table, but they, they come across a lot of reluctance from the system, policymakers and medical professionals. Without good policies or the lack of policies, without incentives for physicians, it's hard to break through the walls. That's what we see in the US, that patients now get access to technologies and information online, and they want to bring it to their doctor-patient relationship. They bring sensors and data, and they expect their caregivers to help to help with those, but they just bump into walls. And that's why the empowered patient revolution started mainly in the US more than a decade ago. And the fourth model, now you can imagine, the model where everything works perfectly. Patients have freedom of choice. If they want to use advanced technologies, they can. If they don't, that's still okay. They get traditional kind of healthcare. And policymakers deploy the right strategies. Can you guess which country is the best example in that? I, I'm telling you now, it's Hungary. No, I'm just kidding, no. It's uh, actually Estonia, where even uh, they use blockchain, artificial intelligence, even grandmothers have access to genetic testing services. At the age of 80, we interviewed grandmothers who had these tests and they were surprised that the government spends money on them at the age of 80, so they can still try to prevent diseases from happening. An excellent way of deploying policies and making patients proactive, making them engage members of this whole ecosystem we call healthcare. So these are, again, generalized examples, but these are the four major models that we see about how countries and governments deal with digital health and its privacy issues. The issue here is if any one of you is thinking about whether it's a choice for us, whether we want to bring digital health technologies to patients, that's not. Patients have decided that already, so that part is done. 
the choice we have now is whether we want to take part in that. We want to help them making it happen or we leave it to them to deal with really advanced technologies that are hard to regulate and hard to keep safe. So that's not our choice for us. We have to help patients. That's our responsibility to bring them the best possible care. And for this, the absolute best thing anyone can do is patient design, making sure that those patients who want to take active part, they are being asked. I had to go to see a Dutch example when, before opening a new facility for the hospital, they invited the chronic patients to have their voices heard. And they did. Patients asked for a round table, not a work desk like in the old days, but a round table where they can, they can feel like they are valued members of this team and they can bring data to the practices. And then when there is a professional examination going on, that was a dentist or clinic, they asked for a, a sign that this is the clinic where we have a physician examining a patient. It's a blue duct tape, but then they just go back being equal partners around the round table. Patient satisfaction is skyrocketing. Physicians love this space because it's much easier to work with empowered patients, less stress, better questions, better compliance. So as a good European, I had to ask about the cost of patient design, and they told me that's an IKEA round table, I guess 50 euros, and that's a blue duct tape on the floor. It's a bit more expensive than the, the original one, so it's one and a half euros-ish. That's the cost of patient design. We can't Actually, no one possibly think that they can develop anything, processes, treatments, technologies for patients without actively involving them from step number one. So that's the best thing we can do, because if we don't do that, then patients will. We have to have patients on the highest level decision making in every major organization and company. The Food and Drug Administration in the US, they already have a patient engagement advisory board. Some pharma companies worldwide are actively thinking about having patients on the C-level of the company, influencing every major decision that they make. So yes, we need patients on the top of WHO, on the top of CDC, every major healthcare organization. That should be step number one for every country and government in the world. If you don't do that, then patients will make it happen. There is a movement in the US called We Are Not Waiting. These are patients with diabetes who found out that it's technologically possible to create do-it-yourself artificial pancreas systems. And as the first device was only approved by the Food and Drug Administration about two years ago, for years before that, they had been making their artificial pancreas at home. It's, it's a mind-blowing technology connecting a, glucose, a blood glucose level sensor with an insulin pump and the algorithm is open access in the cloud. They could download it and on their smartwatch, they could actually watch their artificial pancreas working. They were not waiting for regulations to make it happen. And you know, this is the biggest milestone in the history of medicine. We don't want patients to do this, but we know that the ivory tower of medicine is no more. For 2,000 years since Hippocrates, we've had this ivory tower of medicine. As a physician, I got a key to the gate, so I used the gate, I let you come in, I told you what to do, and you were supposed to to deal with the therapy I prescribed to you. And half of patients do that, half don't. That's the worst efficiency rate at any industry in the world. So now there is no ivory tower of medicine. I, there is no gate, I have no key. What I am now is a guide for patients in the jungle of digital and healthcare information. So the VR and fatigue movement is an excellent sign that this is happening, but we can't let patients create their own technologies. We can't possibly think that the next thing is that they will start printing out with 3D printers their medications. We can't possibly think that they should sequence their DNA at home with you know, black market made devices and then bring that data to an algorithm in the cloud which would give them the right diagnosis. Medicine doesn't work like that. Medicine is not a linear process where we input data, we measure everything about you and we can, we can tell you exactly what gonna, what's gonna happen. That's not how it works. Clinical life is diverse. Same, the sa patients with the same medical condition might describe different symptoms or might have different biomarkers. That's why we need two things here. The amazing supervision, expertise and experience and, and human judgment of medical professionals and the amazing computing power of big data analytics, including artificial narrow and then later artificial general intelligence. So if we don't make it happen for patients, they will find a way and that, that, that's not something we should shoot for. What we should shoot for though is to find 
one kind of motivation that makes us all think about this every day. And this is the what if question. What if this technology goes berserk and creates an, a nightmare scenario about privacy issues? What if that technology is actually the solution for the problems healthcare faces today? And for this, um, I have to leave you with, um, with maybe the best science fiction writer ever. I know people will roast me for this line, but it's Arthur C. Clarke, writer of the 2001 A Space Odyssey, among many other amazing things. The reason why I'm mentioning him is that he grew up on a farm in England. Uh, they didn't have much money, that his family couldn't send him to college. But every night he was stargazing and, and he read science fiction short stories almost every day. So, Every day, he kept playing with the what-if question. What if we have this today in the realms of science, that, that that thing is possible? But what if that just becomes possible the next day? And that's an amazing feeling to have. And you might know that in the 1960s, Arthur C. Clarke predicted social media, um, telemedicine, artificial intelligence, GPS satellites, and a few more issues, more than 50 years ago. So he was quite good at that because he kept on playing with the what-if question. Now that's what's happening in healthcare. If I tell you the word healthcare, I think most of you will not think about as the, the most efficient, the most creative industry in the world. And it's not, as of yet, because it's bound to the ivory tower of medicine this, this ivory tower is no more. So what's happening now is patients are contributing like never before. And this creates a new ecosystem, a new kind of partnership, and a new chance for all of us to have longer and healthier lives by becoming the point of care. And when we think about how we could improve healthcare with these, we have to think about those ideas that just look too good to be true, or just seem to be really dangerous and, and out of bound, like genomic testing. You know, if I ask you 10 years ago, what if we just let patients have their genome sequenced and let them deal with the huge amount of data that come with it? Many of us would have said that that doesn't sound like a good idea, but it is. I learned so many things about the future of my health that now I can rely on my partner physician to get the most out of it in, in, in the long term and have a chance for a long and healthy life. So we have to get used to that. Some ideas look too futuristic or too, too um, out of bound, but that's how science fiction work. And the more we ask ourselves the what if question, the more we can prepare. And as in medicine and healthcare, really amazing things are coming that will make you the point of care, whether you want it or not. It's really important to keep the freedom of choice that we have, and that only happens if we are proactive and taking charge. Thank you for your attention.